everybody to day two uh, HUSECCON. Uh, this morning we have a session of advancing beyond the OT asset inventory, uncovering valuable data for asset management. Um, please help me welcome Ms. Roya Gordon. Thank you. So I first want to thank everyone for coming to my session. I know it's day two of HUSETCON. There's a lot going on, a lot of other interesting talks, um, and he decided to come to this one, especially since the topic isn't really that interesting, and I tried to dress it up and make it more exciting, but it's a pretty cut and dry topic. Um, advancing beyond OT asset inventory, uncovering valuable data for asset management. And I'll give you a little bit of context as to why I chose the topic. So. Um, I've been in the OT security space for quite some time, and um, I'm in a lot of customer engagements, hearing about their challenges and, and pretty much telling them that how we can address their problems. But I have to start from the very beginning of educating them on asset inventory methodologies and how the ecosystem works and the different capabilities and the different methods used um, in order for them to be able to, to make the right decision for what technology works for them. So, um, you know, I do work for a vendor. I work at a company called Hexagon. I'm their executive industry consultant, but this isn't a vendor pitch. This isn't a vendor talk. There won't be screenshots of the tool. Um, this is strictly informative just so whether you're a customer, um, you're a vendor, you're trying to see how to partner with other technologies, it's good for you to understand the different methods um, that these tools use to obtain asset inventory. So it's going to be a long talk, 45 minutes. I'm going to try to cut it down to leave time for Q&A, but um, this is the show flow. I'm gonna start off with learning objectives. I think it's important to have some things in the back of your mind to pay attention to while you're listening to the presentation. Um, I don't wanna assume that everyone in here knows OT. I know this is a security conference, so we're gonna do a bit of an OT primer. Um, for those of you that know this stuff, just go to sleep and you know zone back in, tap back in in 15 minutes. But I'm gonna do an OT primer. I'm gonna talk about the OT threat landscape, threats that we're seeing uh, currently. I'm gonna talk about challenges that organizations are facing when addressing the threats, and that's what's going to get us into asset inventory. I'm going to talk about the different asset inventory methodologies. I'm going to talk about the pros and cons of each, um, and then I'm going to get into asset management and why that's important, and that's when you're going to start to see the difference between asset inventory versus asset management. Uh, then we're going to play a little game, and I'm not going to call on anyone. We're going to play it together, but I'm going to give you some real-world scenarios that I've been a part of where customers have emailed me and called me saying that they have this issue, and we're going to decide, is this something that an asset inventory solution will satisfy or something that an asset management solution will satisfy? I'm going to leave you with some uh, key considerations. So now that you know the different methods and how these tools work, um, what are some external factors you have to consider when deciding uh, which one to go for? And then end with some key takeaways. All right. If you walk away with at least one of these three learning objectives, I will be satisfied with this talk. The first one is understanding the different asset inventory methods. This is important because a lot of the OT security technologies in the ecosystem gets grouped together. Everyone thinks they do the same thing. I was at dinner yesterday and someone asked if we compete with Dragos. I'm like, no, we, we just announced a partnership with Dragos. They do something completely different. So this is the education that the industry needs. So um, you just understanding the different um, capabilities, and I'm, I'm not here to call out vendor names, but we're just going to talk about the different methods that's used. Um, I'm going to talk about the pros and cons of network versus physical layer monitoring. And of course, I'm talking about the OT network. Some of these tools, they monitor the OT network, and there's benefits to that, and there's also some drawbacks. And then there's some tools that are monitoring the physical layer of the industrial processes, and there's also pros and cons to that as well. And the last learning objective is the importance of asset management. Um, and hopefully at this point you understand that there is an evolution. You know, you can't just stay with inventory. You have to evolve to, um, to being able to manage those assets that you have inventory of. 
So I put this diagram together, and I know it's a bit bare bones, but I'm pretty proud of it. Um, I could have, you know, chose a fancy diagram that shows all these industrial control systems, but I think for the point of this presentation and to do this primer, I, I just want to, you know, get to the basics of how these systems work and how they communicate. Now, I'm leaving out a lot of systems. I'm leaving out IT-centric endpoints that's in OT environments. I'm leaving out safety systems. I'm leaving out different servers, but um, I just want to explain this so you get the basics and especially for people that you're, you're new to OT cyber. If you, if you don't understand how these systems work, uh, the rest of the presentation just won't make sense to you. So um, what is OT? So OT refers to the combination of hardware and software used for monitoring, controlling, initiating changes in industrial equipment, assets, processes, and events. All right, so let's start from the bottom up. You have your actuators and your sensors. When you think of an actuator, think of um, something that's actually doing a movement, right? It's a valve that's opening and closing. It's a motor. There's something turning a, a, a cylinder. It's, it's a mechanical movement. And um, a sensor, we all know what sensors are. They're taking elements from the physical environment, whether it's temperature, it's, it's pressure, it's flow, and they're converting that into electrical signals. Now, these two uh, field devices or instrumentation systems, they can't work by themselves. There needs to be a program. And that's where the PLC comes in, the programmable logic controller. And what it's doing is it's pulling the information from the sensor and it's creating commands on what the actuator should do based on those parameters. And we see this, and you know, we use this day to day. Um, I know for me, I set my AC to 75 degrees. I know, even though it's it's not winter time yet, 75 is where my apartment is set at. So if it's going above 75, the AC is going to kick in to bring bring it back down. So that's essentially what's happening in a plant environment. Now, um, for smaller plants, they'll have one PL, a couple of PLCs, and that's fine. But when you know, you're starting to look at bigger plants, there needs to be some type of centralized area where all the PLCs are, are, um, are speaking to, and that's the DCS. So um, in a local control environment, the DCS is gonna be the hub for all the PLCs to talk to, and then the PLCs are gonna be sending out commands to the different field devices. And then you get to central management. This is where your SCADA system sits, your supervisory control and data acquisition system. And if you ever try to remember what it does, it literally says it in the acronym, right? It's acquiring the data. It's um, supervising the processes. So you're going to have some type of uh, human machine interface or UI where you're able to, to see what's going on at the different plant levels. And then you're able to step in and control those environments. Um, and I like to explain this. You know, I used to work in fast food. My first job was at Checkers. And I explain it this way. The actuators and the sensors, that's the people working in the fry machine, right? You're flipping burgers. You're a cashier. Uh, the PLC is the shift supervisor. The DCS is the manager, the store manager, and then the SCADA system, that's, uh, think of corporate, right? Because they're gonna be managing the different stores within, or the different restaurants within the region. Um, so this is the basics of how these systems communicate. All right, so let's get into what we're seeing in the OT cyber threat landscape. There's a lot of um, intricate technologies, monitoring a lot of very important processes, running the power grid, oil and gas pipelines, nuclear facilities, manufacturing facilities. What are the threats to these systems? First, you have end day and zero day vulnerability exploits. So we know what zero days are, but I really want to focus on end days because I personally feel like that's the more important threat to industrial control systems. So with end day vulnerabilities, threat actors wait until a vulnerability is disclosed by the OEM, the original equipment manufacturer, so that they can create an exploit for it. So they're not wasting time trying to find a vulnerability and create an exploit. They just wait until they see the bulletin come out and then they create an exploit tailored to that. And if you look at these bulletins, it tells you the severity score, so it's gonna tell you this is a really severe vulnerability. If it's exploited, a threat actor can take over the system and change passwords and cause damage. So threat actors are checking this, and they're going back and creating exploits because they know that there's delay in patching in OT environments. And we're gonna talk about why that is. Um, so they, they target that window between when the vulnerability is released versus when the end user does the patching. And there's, there's whole threat campaigns around, uh, there's different nation state threat actors that have campaigns around targeting end day vulnerabilities. I know um, some foreign, I won't say what country, but I know some foreign threat actors that will continue to exploit the same vulnerability five to 10 years after it's been announced. So um, again, because that's the lack of, of patching in OT environments. 
Next, you have OTICS malware. So we have malware that's targeting industrial control systems specifically, the vendor, the version, and this is pretty unique. Um, we haven't seen that before up until uh, recently. We have ransomware and wiper malware. We're familiar with ransomware, but wiper malware is more destructive. Um, at the beginning of last year, I believe it was the height of the Ukraine crisis, the FBI put out a private industry notification. So if you're not getting the pins, I, I suggest that you sign up for it, and said that there are about four to five new wiper ma uh, malware variants that are out there. And what a wiper malware is gonna do is it's gonna wipe. It's gonna wipe, completely wipe the entire system. So if you don't have strong backups uh, to pull from, um, um, you know, you're going to be SOL. So um, ransomware, yes, it is still a threat. You know, the threat actor is going to encrypt the data and you're going to have to pay a ransom to get access to it again. Um, they're likely going to take a copy of all of that and sell it on the dark web. But with wiper malware, you can't recoup unless you have strong backups. And then you have the dark web. I honestly wish that more organizations had visibility into the dark web. Um, when I used to run um, a team that you know, checked for threats on the dark web to all of our customers, we would see all sorts of things. Oil and gas manufacturing companies being targeted. Um, we would see a threat actor saying they have a network access for sale for a Fortune 10 company with X amount of employees with this kind of revenue. You get on Google and you figure out who that company is real quickly. Um, and sometimes they'll say they have X amount of hundreds of computers that are compromised. So they're selling all of this stuff on the dark web to other threat actors that are looking to exploit um, these systems in these companies. Um, some of them claim to have access to different SCADA systems. And there were times when I saw things in the news, and I'm like, that's interesting, because on the dark web, I remember them saying they were selling this network access. I wonder if, if that's what I'm seeing happen now. And I, I feel like it'll be really interesting for someone else to do the research, not me, but to kind of try to draw that correlation of what you're seeing on the dark web and how uh, threat actors are targeting on the dark web versus what we're seeing in actuality when, when it's, um, it's actually happening and we're seeing it on the news. And last is insider threats. Insider threats has been on the rise lately, um, especially during the pandemic. A lot of people have lost their jobs, so um, they were getting a little bit desperate for extra income. And uh, the insider or the threat actors have been using a lot of incentives to get people um, to build different types of malware, build different types of kits, actually be an insider threat and go and, and plug something into an industrial control system. Um, and what sucks is that, you know, we're focusing on monitoring the network and external threats, but we're not focusing on the internal threats. And um, the insiders, they're able to bypass the network. So if you're just focused on monitoring the network, um, you're gonna miss uh, insider threat activity. And, and we're gonna get into that when I kind of map that to uh, the MITRE attack for ICS. Okay, so now you did your, you, you know, I did the OT primer, you know, the, uh, the threats that OT, the OT industry is facing. Now let's talk about the challenges. Um, because it should be easy, right? We know how threat actors are targeting OT, then just address the threats. Well, uh, it comes with a lot of challenges. And again, this is just from years of advising uh, different customers. And from 10 years ago until now, I'm having the same conversations. There's the same issues. There's the we don't know what we have. We don't have a proper asset inventory. And um, that's the foundation of OT security. You literally can't do cybersecurity until you know what assets you have. Now, the challenge is these facilities have been built, um, what, since the Industrial Revolution, there's rail, there's oil and gas, there's manufacturing, and there was no asset inventory um, then there was no, we need to keep track of what we have. And if they did, it would be printed out from Excel spreadsheets, put in a binder, maybe not updated for a couple of years. I know at uh, previous organizations, when we would ask for, we called it a systems of systems breakdown, what is your inventory? We would get a whole bunch of random like PDFs and Excels that were years old. And it was just really sad to know that major electric utilities that's, that's running the United States do not have proper inventory of the assets that they have. Um, so once you know what you have, which is literally the first step, you now can do the continuous hardening. You can address the vulnerabilities, but there's challenges in that. There's a lot of legacy systems in 
OT environments because these devices were made to run for 20, 30, even 40 years. You can push it, right? You can push it to 40 if it's still working. Um, so no one's ripping and replacing these devices. As long as it's operational, um, it stays within the environment. However, when it's legacy, meaning it's at its end of life, the, the uh, OEM is no longer supporting that system. So if there's a vulnerability, a patch isn't coming out. So the device is gonna be uh, what we call inherently vulnerable. So um, there's a challenge there in addressing the vulnerabilities. And of course, if you know what you have, you'll know which systems are legacy, are end of life, or are coming up to end of life. So you'll be able to see, wow, in about a year or two years, um, this system is gonna be end of life. I can start planning from now on what I need to replace. And then another challenge is the inability to continuously patch in OT environments. Sorry. There we go. Um, so the inability to patch in, uh, continuously patch in OT environments. We're talking about production environments. There's no pausing. You need continuous electricity. You need uh, to control the flow of oil and gas through pipelines, uh, petrochemical facilities. These processes are running 24 seven. So for example, your 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 company laptop, when they're, they're telling you that, oh, the, you're not gonna have access to the system on the weekend because we're updating, you know, that's normal, that's IT. But with OT, you can't afford that downtime. So a lot of patching gets planned around maintenance periods, which I think is a good strategy. But because of that, threat actors target those end-day vulnerabilities because they know patching isn't happening until once a quarter, maybe twice a year, right? So next you have managing configuration changes. And this is the redheaded stepchild of this whole OT security process because organizations think they have inventory and then they, they're managing vulnerabilities and then that's it. They're doing OT security and their entire OT security or their OT environment is, is managed and secure. Um, but they kind of forget about the, the physical devices. Um, not all information and not all data that's sitting on the asset is being communicated over the network. Um, so there's, there's manual processes that are happening. There's devices that, um, like a safety system, for example, it'll communicate on the network if it's triggered, but if it's not triggered, it won't be communicating. So you're gonna kind of miss that inventory if you're depending on um, pulling inventory from you, you, the network. So managing configuration changes, it's overlooked because people look at OT security as inventory and vulnerabilities. And next we have risk analytics, risk management, risk assessments. You can't do any of this until you know what you have. You don't know what risks you have until you know the devices you have, you know what's vulnerable and you have a plan to address the vulnerabilities until you're managing configuration changes. So oftentimes organizations can't even get to managing risks until they've started from step one and they work their way down. So um, as you it's a bit challenging when it comes to addressing all those threats in OT environments. It's not as straightforward as it would be in IT. And then last is response, backups, and recovery. Um, so I read a lot of compliance documents, and when I look at how the industry is prioritizing how they're addressing security in OT, backups and recovery is always the last thing on their list. It's a third priority. We need to get to these things first. And I understand, but you know, say you have an event that happens at your plant, um, you know, how are, if you don't have an incident response retainer, then, you know, you're not going to be able to remediate. You're not going to be able to know how the threat actor got into the environment with systems they've affected. Um, you're not going to know if they've made any changes to the configurations, if an insider made changes to the configuration. So it's, you know, if you're not checking all the boxes, you're not going to know how to do proper response. Um, of course, backing up your systems. I know where I'm at right now, we do asset inventory and backups at the same time. So you don't have to wait until the tail end of this process to then do backups as an afterthought you get everything backed up right away, which I think is, is the right approach. So this should probably be a circle, actually, instead of linear, but I didn't create this diagram. Okay, so now let's get into the meat and potatoes of the presentation, which is the different asset inventory methodologies. And I'm not gonna go through all of the different challenges. We're really just gonna hone in on asset inventory because that is the foundation of OT security. There are three main methods used to collect asset information for an asset inventory. There's the network tap and the DPI, which is the deep packet inspection. There's active querying, 
and then there's configuration files. And I'm gonna go through each of these and explain what they are and the pros and cons of each. And I think this is important because depending on what you're looking for will depend on uh, which one you go for. If you're looking for um, network monitoring because you wanna see if there's any threat actors in your OT environment, then maybe the network tap and DPI solution will be best. However, if you're creating a system that's completely air, ga air gap, like we have some customers that are building some systems that are really sensitive and they don't want it to touch the network at all. Well, maybe you wanna do asset inventory and, and further asset management of that system um, without touching the network. So we're gonna get into it. So I have to click here and then click on my laptop, so. <laughs> Um, so network tap and DPI. So it's just as how it sounds, a tap. Think of the CIA tapping someone's phone. They're listening in, probably taking a copy, taking a, record of, a recording of that conversation, but they're not able to interject. So when you're tapping the network, you're doing just that. You're taking a copy of the network traffic and then you're analyzing it, right? Which is where the deep packet inspection comes in. Now there's benefits to this. Um, benefits are, it's passive, it's non-evasive to OT environments. You're not interjecting into the OT network, you're not touching the OT network, you're literally taking a copy of all of the communications and you're analyzing it and you're deriving asset information that way. And it's, it's pretty quick, right? Um, because these processes are continuous. You're able to do the deep packet inspection. Um, I, I did mention providing the basic information to OT systems relatively quickly. And because you, you're able to see all of that network traffic and the communications happening on the network, you can then pair it with threat intelligence. You're able to do anomaly detection, threat detection, and different prevention. You're able to block malware. So if you, if you look at a lot of the OT security solutions out there that utilize the network, a lot of them have threat intelligence teams because they're not just monitoring the network for inventory, they're doing it for also threat intelligence, and that makes a lot of sense. Now, some challenges with that is you're not gonna get visibility into detailed level to one zero inventory because that data isn't always communicated via the network. Remember that diagram I showed you in the beginning, the one that I put together? Um, you have sensors, you have actuators. They're communicating or they're taking commands from the PLC, but they're not communicating via the OT network. They're safety systems. So there's a lot of other systems in the environment that um, that you're gonna miss if you're just looking at what's communicating via the OT network. Uh, and many assets are islanded or disconnected. And then there's tens of thousands of events to parse. So, you know, you have to make sure that, and there's obviously the solutions do this well, but you're gonna have to parse through a lot of events to get to the, this is the vendor, this is the version, uh, this is the IP, and this is the information I need to really build an asset inventory. Something I wanna add here too, which is really important, you see the, the communications, you see what is supposed to be communicating to what, and then mm, this is outside, something from an outside server, they're trying to communicate to this, um, to our OT network, that's strange. So you're able to not just have visibility into the devices, but monitor the communication paths um, between them, which is really important. Okay, so next, the next method is active queries. So active queries, you know, uh, previously the uh, network tap and DPI was passive. Active is actively sending specific requests or commands to OT systems within the industrial infrastructure via the network. So you're using the OT network to craft packets or craft queries to, um, to ask the system specific questions, right? There's benefits to this. I know it sounds scary, like why would I want anything utilizing the OT network that's already sensitive to communicate? It could possibly cause disruptions. And yeah, there are challenges, but let's talk about some of the benefits. So there's a growing market acceptance uh, as the passive network detection limitations become better understood. There are some network tap and DPI solutions that actually augment their asset inventory doing asset queries. So they know that they're only able to see 70, 80% of an inventory, so then they'll use an active query um, on an as-needed basis, not on, on a continuous basis, to kind of fill in those gaps. And again, it can provide that deeper visibility. Um, and it can be used in conjunction. So, um, you know, these two methods are used interchangeably, um, which again, it, it allows you to get a deeper visibility into your inventory to reach those assets that aren't communicating via the network. Challenges to that are, you know, improper targeting can disrupt OT services. 
especially in an environment that doesn't have just one vendor. So some smaller plants, they're all gonna use Rockwell or they're, they're all gonna use that one vendor. And in a way that works because, you know, Rockwell will have like asset center and they'll have ways where you can just manage the assets because it's all from the same vendor. But when you're working with different vendors and different systems. Um, you have to use, uh, you have to craft the queries in specific ways using specific protocols. And so different protocols may require different commands and formats. And if you're, you're crafting it and you're trying to communicate to the device, you can cause it to disrupt, you can cause it to malfunction, you can cause it to break down. So that's the risk there when you're, you're trying to use the OT network to communicate with these devices. Um, you know, the network design may be severely constrained. Um, you don't want any latency. Um, it's not well suited for islanded OT systems. So you're still gonna have the issue of not reaching systems that aren't communicating via the OT network. And then it may violate OEM vendor warranties. And when I say OEM, I'm meaning, you know, original equipment manufacturers. So we're talking about the companies, the vendors that make the industrial control systems, your Honeywells, your Rockwells, your ABBs, et cetera. Now, there are some organizations that, or some cyber vendors that are able to bypass that, but I've been on the customer side and it's a question that you wanna ask upfront before you get any kind of technology because you don't wanna buy this technology then realize you're gonna be violating your vendor warranties and it's going to cancel out or they won't respond because it, it you know you just got to get approval that there's certain technologies that are allowed to communicate directly to the industrial control system and the last method so i talked about two right the passive which is the act uh, the the passive which is the network tap and dpi the active and now I'm gonna talk about the other method, which is configuration files. You're pulling the asset details directly from configuration files. And what you're doing there is you're not waiting to see what's communicating via the network. You're going to the source and the device itself and you're pulling all of that asset information on all of the asset details. And because you have deeper visibility into your assets, now you can properly manage your assets. Right? Because it goes beyond just visibility and knowing what you have. Now you're able to physically manage the configurations, manage the processes. You're able to test the reliability of your systems. So it's not you know, what uh, traditionally we think of cybersecurity. We think of threat actors in the environment and someone's targeting. But you know, wouldn't you want to know if systems are reliable? They're not tampered with from within. It could be human error. All of these are still security issues, right? They're internal. It could be negligent. But you need to have have um, visibility into that deeper layer so that you can um, you can secure your your uh, industrial processes so benefits so I kind of mentioned this you're gonna get deeper visibility you're gonna get configuration data on input output cards control strategies installed software firmware I know you're able to see um, slots in the chassis that's open and you're able to reserve like hey okay there's two more slots left I want to reserve that for 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 something else and you're able to kind of do that automatically using technology versus there being an email back and forth of, of of trying to do that so again it gets down to managing your ICS assets um, know when unauthorized control log ch logic changes occur in your critical assets, including safety systems. Again, safety systems get a little bit left out when you're doing you know, a network tap and DPI. Um, it supports the, the isolated, the transient systems, air-gapped assets. And I know we think air-gapped isn't a real thing, but I've been in conversations recently, and there are organizations that are like, we're making this completely air-gapped. It's not going to touch the network, and we need something to manage this process in a bubble. So, um, and it, you know, if it's a sensitive process, especially when you're working with the government, that's what they're going to be um, looking for. It doesn't violate any vendor warranty. You're not trying to probe the system. You're not trying to create an, a, a query using the OT network to ask it questions that could probably shut it down. Um, and you establish a trusted restore point. So pulling from the configuration files, um, it's not directly from the PLC. It's from the backups. So you're backing up all of these configuration files, you're creating a, a trusted restore point, and then you're using that to, um, to manage the assets. You're using all that data. Um, and you're, you're contextualizing it, you're normalizing it because you're pulling this from all the different vendors. And um, so anyways, there's a process for that. I'm not here to do like the vendor pitch, but um, it pairs well with a network tap and DPI solution. So here's the thing. I, you know, I came from a company that did network tap and DPI. I'm now over here at this company. People are thinking, oh, you're at a competitor company. I'm like, no, we actually pair well together. You know, they're looking at the network. We're not. We're looking down here. They're not. So 
it pairs well together. Now, like everything else, there are challenges, and I'm an advisor at you know, at heart at first, I'm not in sales, so I'm gonna tell everyone the truth that there are challenges with this. Um, you must obtain account privileges required to collect data from these different systems. And, you know, there, um, there could be drawbacks, like if there are uh, assets that a customer uses that we don't have an asset model built for, then, you know, it, it just wouldn't be a good fit because we have to build asset models for every single industrial control systems to be able to, to pull that data and to normalize it, right? Um, and that means it takes time. You know, this isn't going to be a plug and play. So if you need to meet compliance by the end of the year and you need asset inventory, then pulling from the configuration files like this method wouldn't be for you. You might need to do that network tap so you can get the quickest visibility. Um, and then there's no real-time OT network monitoring, so you're not going to get the threat intelligence. You're not going to know if Iran, Russia, China, they're in your network because even though you're, you're doing asset management, your, your network or your processes will still be at risk. All right, so those are the three methods. And this is just a quick visual. I'm not going to get too deep into it, but I just wanted you all to, to kind of visually see what I just explained, right? Um, this is an IT-centric view of ICS cyber endpoints, right? That's about 20% of the IT environment. This is where the network tap and the DPI plays. They're able to see all the different, you know, uh, control systems, the IT systems, the OT systems, um, but they're not able to see this they're not able to see um, this part of the environment, the production-centric view. They're not able to see, and even though they can see there's a DCS, they can see there's a PLC, they're not gonna be able to see the configuration changes to be able to compare them side by side. They're not gonna be able to see the instrumentation systems, those sensors and those actuators I was telling you about. So on the right-hand side, if you take a look, I tried to layer it for you all so you can kind of see how this all works together. Network tap and DPI, they're utilizing the network. Active query is leveraged to get a a little bit deeper, but then you need to pull from the configuration files if you want to see all of the asset information. All right, so why does it matter? Why asset management? And hopefully right now it's clear what asset management is versus asset inventory, right? Asset management, it ensures the security, the reliability, and overall integrity of ICS environments. It's not focused on threat actors and threat activity. Um, there is an element to an inventory to this because in order to manage the assets, you have to have the inventory, but you're, you're focused on managing the physical processes at the plant level, which is different from just obtaining an inventory and having visibility into how your devices communicate. Okay, so now we're gonna have some fun, right? Um, we're gonna play a game, right? Asset inventory versus asset management. And you all can raise your hand. Um, I mean, I'm gonna give the answers anyway, but I'll pause to see if anyone, you know, wants to play. Um, so these are some questions that I've gotten throughout my career. Um, and you know, I never, the conversation was never around what should I do? Should I get asset inventory, asset management? But I thought it would just make a great way for us to think about how do we categorize these two capabilities? All right, customer challenge one. Hi, Roya. I work in the manufacturing sector and recently experienced a cybersecurity incident that, impact, that impacted our production process. After a full investigation, it was determined that this incident might have been attributed to a lack of visibility and understanding of our OT assets and the vulnerabilities associated with them. Can you help us address this? All right, what do you all think? Who thinks this is an asset inventory challenge? Okay, who thinks this is more of an asset management challenge? I'm sorry guys. It's asset inventory. Here's, here's the key message. Hold on, let me go back. He said that there was a um, recently experienced a cybersecurity incident impacted the production process. Um, they didn't have full visibility or lack of visibility to understand the OT assets and vulnerabilities associated with them. So this is a bit of a trick question because 
you know, they're not talking about configuration files. They're not talking about, um, for example, I know a common issue is if uh, an engineer puts a safety system in bypass while doing maintenance, um, they forget to reconnect the system. So they'll think, man, th there's a cyber attack happening, um, but it's really no cyber attack. It's because they forgot to reconnect the, the maintenance system. So there, it, the issue wasn't anything like that. It seems to be like asset inventory could satisfy this problem because they just need visibility and understand OT assets and the vulnerabilities that they have, right? And again, there's nuances to this, but but that's why we're doing this because you know um, there is a nuance here. Okay, the next one. We're hearing in the news that insider threats are on the rise. There have been recent stories about disgruntled contractors manipulating PLCs months after they were let go. How do we address the insider threat problem in OT environments? All right. Who's thinking asset inventory? Ooh, y'all are good. Who's thinking asset management? Yeah. <laughs> yes, this is definitely something that asset management will address. And I want to talk about um, I want to talk about the MITRE attack for ICS real quick. I presented this at the ICS conference in Atlanta last year, and I thought it was super interesting, and people were telling me, wow, we never looked at it like this before. So I wanted to, um, to share this with you all. So um, everyone knows MITRE, but MITRE did an attack uh, for ICS to show how a threat actor gains initial access and targets and, and creates an impact in an OT environment. So it's about, what, an 11-step process. I realized that insiders they cut out half the process because they don't need initial access. They're already in the environment. They already have credentials. They don't need evasion. Um, they don't need to move laterally because they can go directly to the industrial control system and, and go directly to where they need to cause the damage. So they're kind of starting off at the collection phase. They're starting off with collecting sensitive information possibly to sell to threat actors. They're able to set up a C2 command and control for threat actors. They're able to manipulate and modify responses, so like alerting um, and safety functions. They're able to manipulate and modify industrial control systems, systems and processes, so not just the alerting and the safety systems, but the actual uh, configuration of the industrial control systems themselves. And they're able to cause impact, the cyber physical impact, whether it's loss of view, um, whether it's loss of safety, um, whether the system shuts down, the process stops. And this is really important to understand because if we're just focusing on external threats and focusing on the network, you're gonna miss the insider that cuts out all that process and they're able to cause damage and impact directly into um, the OT system. So this is just kind of something to, to look at to remind you that, hey, we do kind of need to be looking at industrial control systems at the, the physical layer level. We need to be comparing configuration files, um, which the next example is gonna be very interesting. And it's true, it's true. It's a story that a customer told me from a challenge that they had a while ago, so it's not a recent challenge, but you'll be pretty surprised how, and I, I, I know a lot of you worked in plants before, you'll be pretty uh, surprised as to how they would do things and record things when it comes to configurations. So last customer challenge. We currently have a rule that when someone makes a program change, we require them to make a screen print of the changes showing the old logic and the new changes and then put a paper copy of the screen print in a logbook. So they're taking a screen print, printing it out, and then putting it in a logbook and putting it side by side with the old one, right? Um, the intent is that if someone in the plant is not working, our programmers and maintenance people can check the logbook for any programming changes. It seems pretty straightforward. Problem is that the logbook quickly becomes large and hard to use. And many people who make the changes to the PLC program, they're fighting an emergency and they feel that they do not have time to record their changes, so they fail to record their changes. This one should be pretty easy. Who thinks this is an asset inventory issue? Okay, what about asset management? This is definitely an asset management issue because they're not focusing on inventory visibility, we don't know what we have, they're focused on comparing configuration changes. And if you're just changing configurations of a PLC and there's no record of it, 
there's no known good. What's the baseline? What is it supposed to look like? So they were trying to create a process where, um, hey, if you make a change, that's fine, but put the screenshot next to it. But again, if, if you're in the middle of a challenge, you're not going to have time. It, people forget. Um, so there needs to be a digital way of doing it. And there's a lot of technologies out there now that makes it easier to do that. But that's asset management. You're not going to get that from an asset inventory solution. So as I'm wrapping up, um, I'm getting lipstick on the mic. I'm so sorry. <laughs> so some things to take into consideration. There are external factors that you should consider when deciding on uh, what works best. Uh, the scope. Are you looking for, um, are you trying to meet compliance? Are you concerned about threat activity and threat actors? Um, is your issue really a configuration management issue, an asset management issue, and you already have a network monitoring solution? So what is the scope of this? Um, what is the network impact? Do you want a, a tool that's going to active, or uh, even if it's once in a while, but they're going to leverage the OT network to, to communicate with your devices? Do you want that? You know, and some organizations don't, some of them don't mind. Scalability, are you doing this in, in one environment? Are you doing this in multiple environments? I know that we've sp spoken to customers that have plant, like global plants, but they want this one plant completely air gap because it's, it's sensitive. The configuration and setup. Again, the network tap and DPI, that's a plug and play. You'll get asset inventory relatively quickly. Um, but if you want to pull from configurations and, and deal with the, the normalizing of all the data, that's going to take some time. Um, you'll, you'll get more data in the long run, but, but do you have the time and the due diligence to, to, um, to do that with the, whatever deadlines you have set up in your scope? Um, security, again, are you focused on uh, the, the security of your network or are you more focused on the security and the reliability and the consistency of the devices in your plant? Ease of use, you know, I don't think anyone really likes the UIs and any of this technology. They're just not good to look at, they're not fun to play with, but um, as long as it's a little bit intuitive, as long as there's training, I think, you know, it, you just got to get used to it. The cost, you know, so of course that's going to be a major difference, but you got you to gotta look at it this way. It might be more expensive if you're going to get more access to more of the data on the industrial control systems. It's going to be a little cheaper if it's just a plug and play. Oh, yeah, I just told you the name and the version of the devices and what they're communicating. So when, when you're evaluating the technologies and the cost, you can't compare apples to oranges. Um, compliance, um, it's safe to say that all of the solutions meet compliance, but uh, configuration management is now becoming a part of compliance. And I, I was just uh, brushing up on 62443, actually 800.82 yesterday, and I'm, I'm reading their recommendations for compliance, and it still recommended logbooks. It said, you know, hey, organizations may use logbooks. And I'm like, why would they recommend that? And I, and I get it, there are challenges with incorporating new cyber technologies in your environment. But um, so one solution may meet compliance while the other may not. Integrations, how uh, well do these tools integrate with, with other technologies within your environment, with SIMS, um, you know, that's a big one because integration is really, really big nowadays. Um, there's partnerships and also pay attention to that, you know, you can announce a partnership with another technology, but that doesn't mean that there's an integration there. So definitely ask the right questions. And vendor support. Sometimes you buy a solution and um, when you have an issue, you have no one to call and you're left hanging dry and they haven't leveraged the GSIs. They haven't leveraged Accenture or Deloitte or EY. Um, you know, to, to train them up and get certified so that they can be boots on ground helping with their issues. So that's also something to take into consideration. Who's going to help me once I deploy this technology? Who's going who's gonna to help me? And uh, do GSIs know enough about your technology? Are they educated enough to be able to, to help me address my issues? But overall, for complex environments, you can have both, right? It's not one or the other. You can have that visibility of your network and then have the visibility of your OT environment. And the key takeaways are just the learning objectives that I talked about earlier. And I hope that you're able to answer these questions. Do you know the different asset inventory methods? Do you know the pros and cons of monitoring the network versus monitoring the physical layer? And do you know the importance of asset management? And I will just like to say this last thing. I have like 30 seconds left. Um, so most organizations are here. They 
they do asset inventory, and then they're like, yeah, now we can do vulnerability management and threat intelligence, and our OT network is secure. But you want to get to that golden egg, which is asset management. And I tend to see a lot more mature audiences understand that, and then they evolve to that. So with that being said, this concludes my presentation. I, perfect. I was right on time. Um, thank you so much. Add me on LinkedIn. I'm always sharing things that I'm doing and just, you know, sharing interesting things. I think it's interesting. So definitely add me on LinkedIn, and I will be around. I'm sorry I didn't have time for Q&A, but I'll be around to talk about this further. Thank you.